Pardon me? Someone say something? No? Yeah, I'm going to do the three woes, but I, I'm th I think I might have a quote in here that I would throw in at this point. Or I might not, and I'll know in just a second. There's a very nice quote, and for some reason I th thought I had it in these quotes, and it looks as if I don't. Um, and there's a very nice quote where Sister White um, endorses the rules of prophetic interpretation adopted by William Miller, and when she endorses it, she, f she first quotes the first four or five of them. You know, you're some of you are familiar with that quote. And then she makes a statement, you know, that these, these rules of biblical interpretation are still valid. This is a paraphrase. But those people at the end of the world that are studying prophecy are going to be operating upon those same principles. And um, I thought I had this, those in there. Pardon me? 69? Yeah, that's, isn't that what yeah. Okay, that this is that's one of them, but this that's not the one I was thinking of where she quotes his rules specifically, but on the top of page 69, those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are s searching the scriptures upon the same plan that Father Miller adopted. And that that's good enough, but there's one place where she's specific about his rules of prophetic interpretation. I don't, how, how many of you have seen his rules of prophetic interpretation? I mean, they're, they're structured rules and she places her endorsement on them and uh, I have them here. Um... These are they. And if you haven't ever seen them, um, th it's worth taking a look. It goes on to the, um, the next two pages. And I think I might have that quote in here. Evidently not. But in any case, as we begin, if you haven't ever looked at William Miller's Rules of Bible Prophecy, you can hand that around and um, take a look at it. The, the point that I'm making by that is that the primary rule that William Miller is known for is the year day principle. But the year day principle is first identified in God's word in the book of Numbers that was written by Moses. So the year day principle of Bible prophecy had been in the Bible for hundreds and hundreds of years before William Miller came on the scene of history. So the year day principle of Bible prophecy, it was true, but in the history of William Miller it became present truth because it was at that time that the rule needed to be applied um, to uh, what are you giving me this for? You got that quote in here? Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a copy going around for those that haven't seen it also. Um, anyway, what I'm saying is is that in this history it was important for them to identify the truth connected with the time prophecies in Daniel and therefore one of the principles, one of the rules that had been in the Bible for hundreds of years changed from truth to present truth because now that rule had to be used to establish the present truth message of this time period. Okay. And the point I'm making here is a little bit, uh, I'm going to make a jump here. If this history is repeated to the very letter in this history, the history of the 100, 144,000, then it's worth considering that the prophetic message that is unsealed in 1989 and that is going to test this generation, that there will also be rules of prophetic interpretation that have been in the Bible for hundreds of years, but suddenly those rules become present truth because they are rules that are needed to identify, establish, and uphold the message of this time period. 
Do you, you follow my argument, the logic, even if you haven't tested to see it's true? Because that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that there were certain rules that Miller understood, and none of them were, all of them were in, from the Bible and had been in there for a long time. They'd always been truth, but in the history of the Millerites, they became present truth because then they were the rules that were needed to establish the message, and therefore, if that history is going to repeat, it would be, con it's at least worth considering that there may be rules of Bible prophecy that are recognized at this time in history that have a different significance now because they are part of the present truth message because they are part of what allows you to clarify and establish the message of the hour. And one of those rules is a triple application of prophecy. And the Bible teaches that upon the testimony of two or three a thing is established. And this principle has been in the Bible, it's, you know, all the way through but it's important to, to recognize this principle now because some of the truths that are being identified about the third angel's message and the warning message at this time are are very well clarified and established by applying a triple application of prophecy and a triple application of prophecy has its own internal rules that govern it um, once you see what a triple application of prophecy is you'll see that it's teaching a certain lesson and that it has uh, the rule itself has its own principles inside that allow you to have confidence um, that the results you're seeing are in agreement with the Word of God. If you turn to Malachi, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you one triple application of prophecy, and then I'm going to just tell you a couple other ones so that you've seen three of them that you can test. Because the Bible says, upon a, the testimony of two or three, a thing is established. So once we've established this rule and got you to the point to where you can see how it works, then we're going to take the rule and make an application with it that is um, serious. In Malachi chapter 4, it says, Behold, in verse 5, Malachi 4 verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And the great and dreadful day of the Lord is the end of the world. Um, all you have to do is, is run that, that topic through the Old Testament. The great and dreadful day of the Lord is the day of the Lord's wrath. It's, it's a seven last plagues. It's the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And there's a promise by Malachi that before the end of the world, the Lord was going to send Elijah the prophet. Now we know there was an Elijah. But we know also that Christ, I hope we know this, so we don't have to take the time to show this, but usually we know this, um, that Christ identified John the Baptist as Elijah. Okay, John the Baptist is the second Elijah. And what, I, what I'm saying, in a triple application of prophecy, there are some Bible prophecies that you find being fulfilled or identified three times. Once you see those prophecies that are identified three times, then you will find, as you investigate them and test them, that the characteristics of the first fulfillment when combined with the characteristics of the second fulfillment will identify and establish the characteristics of the third and final fulfillment. And so Elijah um, Elijah is foundational Adventist understanding. Um, in this book that Brother Leo brought up, this is a very good book um, that covers the Millerite history and uh, correct me if I'm wrong those of you that read this book but I think it, it's in this book where he identifies that after a, the disappointment of 1844 the Millerites that were going to follow on in this message the first thing they needed to do is find out what happened at that disappointment so they turned to the Bible to find out who they were what they were where they are identified in the Bible so they would know what just happened and if they really were God's people and the first biblical understanding that they came to recognize about who they were immediately after 1844 is that they were Elijah and that's the first the first applica biblical application that was placed upon Adventists after 1844 so when we're talking about Elijah this is an application applying Elijah to Adventism that's been here from the very beginning, okay? Um, 
So what we're saying is, the characteristics in the story of the first Elijah, when combined with the characteristics of the story in the second Elijah, which is John the Baptist, will establish the characteristics of the third and final Elijah. And Elijah the first had to deal with a threefold enemy. Je this is Jezebel. This is an impure woman. And Jezebel was married to Ahab, a civil power. Was Jezebel supposed to be married to Ahab? Unlawful, unlawful relationship. We're not going to teach everything about this. We're not going to teach all the truths that are connected with the triple application of Elijah. All I'm trying to do here is let you see how a triple application of prophecy works, how it's governed. Okay, and Elijah was the king of the northern kingdom of, of ancient Israel. And, um, and how many tribes are in the northern kingdom? Ten. So let's put that in there just because it is interesting. So in the first Elijah, he's dealing with an impure woman, Jezebel. And in the seven churches of Revelation, the fourth church is Thyatira. And what does Thyatira represent? What history? His, the history of the 1260 years of papal rule. And in the church of Thyatira, what symbol is used to represent the papal church? Jezebel. Okay. Jezebel is a symbol of the papacy. Um, impure woman in an unlawful relationship with a civil power. And then the prophets of Baal do the dance of the de deception. They danced around their offering all day long in order to deceive the people. So Elijah had to deal with a threefold power. You see it? Jesus says John the Baptist is the second Elijah. And he had to deal with a th threefold power. An impure woman, Herodias. And she was married to Herod, a civil power. Were they supposed to be married? No, because Herodias was married to Herod's brother. So it was once again an unlawful relationship. And in this prophecy, who did the dance of deception? Salome. And who was Salome? The daughter of Rome. Okay, or the daughters of Rome. Or the Protestant churches, the daughters of the papacy. Okay, so when you look at the characteristics of the first Elijah and you combine it with the characteristics of the second Elijah, you are establishing the characteristics of the third Elijah. Now, the third Elijah has to do with the threefold power. An impure woman, the papacy, which, which Revelation 16 calls the beast. And the papacy comes into an unlawful relationship with the kings of the earth. And in Revelation 17, the kings of the earth, the civil power, is represented as ten kings. And in Revelation 16, they're called the dragon. And if you don't think that the ten kings of Revelation 17 are the dragon power, you go to Testimonies to Ministers. The page number is not popping. Page 38. And it says... King, kings, governors, rulers, kings, governors, and rulers, a group of politicians, kings, governors, and rulers have, take, have taken the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon that goes to make war with the saints. So she says it's a multitude of political figures that make up the dragon power at the end of the world. And in Revelation 16, God's people, Elijah the third, have to deal with a threefold enemy. And in the terms of Revelation 16, it's the, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And we know as Adventists that the false prophet is apostate Protestantism in the United States, which Revelation 13 says deceives the whole world. They're, they do the dance of deception. The dance of deception by Salome is paralleling the dance of deception by the prophets of Baal and they're both identifying the deceiving actions of the false prophet of the United States at the end of the world. The civil power of Ahab and civil power of ten kings combined with the civil power of Herod is illustrating the civil power at the end of the world, the dragon, the ten kings of Revelation 17, that agree, according to Revelation 17, to give their kingdom unto the beast, the papal beast, the impure woman, Herodias, Jezebel, for a short space at the end of the world. This is a triple application of prophecy. In uh, Revelation, 7, Revelation 7, we see two groups of 
Christians at the end of the world. Um, you have first the 144,000 and the 144,000 one of the characteristics that we as Adventists know of the 144,000 is they live until the return of the Lord right they don't die but the great multitude they're given white robes and uh, and the martyrs of the fifth seal are also given white robes but the martyrs in the fifth seal they ask the question if you're familiar with the fifth seal how long until you judge the papacy for killing us during the 1260 years of papal rule and the answers given to them you rest in your graves a little season until there is a group of martyrs made up that die as you die and sister white takes the fifth seal in that conversation between the martyrs and the answer and she places it in revelation 18 in the sunday law time period when the martyrdom takes place among those in the testing time of the mark of the beast so the answer to, to the martyrs of the dark ages, they said, when are you going to punish the papacy? When are you going to punish the papacy for killing us during the dark ages? And the answer in the fifth seal is you rest in your graves because there's another group of people that are also going to be martyrs under the papal persecution. And when that period arrives, then I'm going to deal with the papacy. And that's why in Revelation 18, when it's talking about the... Revelation 17 and 18, you're talking about the judgment of Babylon. And in verse 6 of... Revelation 18 it might be verse 5 but I think it's verse 6 it's verse 6 it says reward her even as she rewarded you and double to her double according to her works in the cup which she has filled filled to her double because she's being punished for the martyrdoms that was carried out during the dark ages and the martyrdom that takes place during the Sunday law crisis and in Revel if you're in Revelation in Revelation 20 verse 4 it speaks about the martyrs during the Sunday law crisis. It says this. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast. These are people that are beheaded during the time period that you're being forced to worship the beast which had not worshipped the beast neither his image neither had received the mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years uh, the martyrs of during the Sunday law cri testing time the way that their martyrdom is illustrated is they lose their heads so what I'm saying is in Revelation 7 there's two groups of Christians that are prepared the first is 144,000 which did not die. Did Elijah die? And one group that's illustrated as being martyrs. And John the Baptist, did he die? How did he die? He lost his head. So as you as you I shouldn't do stuff like that. Just left it alone. But as, as you take a triple application of prophecy and you look closely at the characteristics of the first fulfillment and you combine it with the characteristics of the second fulfillment, you will define, identify the characteristics of the third fulfillment. And there is much more. I, believe me, I'm just, I'm not teaching the three Elijahs here. I'm trying to illustrate how a triple application of prophecy works. It works if you take the first fulfillment, the characteristics, and combine it with the second it will establish the third. Do you understand the, the logic of it even if you haven't tested it to see if it's valid? If so, say amen. amen. Okay. That's one illustration of a triple application of prophecy. Another one that you can look to is our message is Babylon is fallen is fallen. Is that a fair way to express our message here at the end of the world? The fourth angel's message is that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Sister White uses that as, the, as a way to identify our message. But why is it Babylon is, why is our message Babylon is fallen, is fallen? Why isn't our message Babylon is fallen? Beca because our message that we carry to the world concerning the fall of Babylon is, is based upon a triple application of prophecy. There there were Babel, Babel fell in Genesis 10 and 11 in the story of Nimrod and when you take the characteristics of the far, fall of Babel in Genesis 10 and 11 and you combine it with the characteristics of the fall of Babylon in Daniel 5 and Belshazzar 
you will be identifying the characteristics of the fall of spiritual Babylon at the end of the world. Our message is conveyed upon a triple application of prophecy. The characteristics of the fall of Babel combined with the characteristics of the fall of Babylon are what illustrates the characteristics of the fall of modern Babylon. And I'm just keeping that one real simple, but if you're not familiar with that, um, that is absolutely the terminology that the book of Revelation uses to describe the fall of Babylon. I mean, what does it mean in Revelation when it says that the Euphrates dried up, dried up that the way of the kings of the east has been prepared? Where is that, where is that terminology coming from? How did Belshazzar's Babylon fall? The Euphrates was dried up, it was sidetracked. That the, the Medes and the Persians, the kings of the east, could come in and conquer it. See, the, the, the fall of spiritual or modern Babylon in Revelation is, is established, the characteristics, by combining the fall of Babel and Babylon in Daniel 5. That's why our message is, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It's a triple application of prophecy. Okay? There are three Romes. If you take the characteristics of pagan Rome and combine them with the characteristics of papal Rome, you will be identifying the characteristics of modern Rome. And uh, this is an easy one to see and I'm not going to take much time with it, but who is the, what's the title of the head of pagan Rome? What's the title of the head of pagan Rome? Pontifus Maximus. What was the title of the head of papal Rome? What's the, what's the title of modern Rome's head? Pontifus Maximus. Was pagan Rome a persecuting power? Was papal Rome a persecuting power? Is modern Rome going to persecute? Did pagan Rome rule the world supremely for a period of time? For how long? For a time. Daniel 11.24 For 360 years it was invincible from 31 BC in the Battle of Actium until the year 330 when Constantine moved the capital of the empire from the city of Rome to Constantinople. How many understand that history? How many don't understand that history? Raise your hands. Okay, th th in Daniel, th th follow me now because this, is the har this sometimes is the hardest meeting. It's after lunch, so our, our stomach's digesting food and it's, it's warm and if you're not familiar with it, take Dan Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith and he will identify that Daniel 11 verse 24 is dealing with pagan Rome and it says that pagan Rome is going to rule the world for a time and a time is 360 years. And the beginning of the time period when pagan Rome ruled the world supremely was the year 31 BC at the, one of the most famous naval battles in ancient history. It was the Battle of Actium. And that's what put Rome in place to rule for a time. You project 360 years into the future and you come to the year 330, which is when Constantine moved the capital of the empire from the city of Rome to Constantinople. And from that point on, the Roman Empire began to fall apart. It had been divided into east and west. Why did it begin to fall apart? There's a principle. National apostasy is followed by national ruin. And in 321, Constantine passed the first Sunday law. In 330, he divided the kingdom in half and the kingdom began to disintegrate because national apostasy is followed by national ruin. How was the kingdom disintegrated in fulfillment of Daniel 7? The kingdom is going to divide into ten nations. How was that accomplished? The trumpet powers of Revelation. So this is all prophetic history that is... is the DNA, DNA of Adventist understanding if we're standing on the foundations. But the point is, is in Daniel 8, 9, when it's identifying how pagan Rome was going to take control of the world, it said it would have to conquer three geographical areas. It says the east, the south, and the pleasant land. Before pagan Rome was going to rule the world for 360 years supremely, it first had to conquer Syria, Egypt, and Israel. Okay? And the third of those entities was Egypt that was conquered in 31 BC. Papal Rome ruled the world supremely for how long? 1260 years. What, what allows us to start this 1260 year time period? It's when Papal Rome conquers its third geographical obstacle. 
pagan Rome had to conquer Syria, Egypt, and Israel to begin the time period when it ruled supremely. Papal Rome had to overcome the three horns, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, and the Vandals. And the third of those horns was the Goths that were driven out of the city of Rome in the year 538. And then Papal Rome ruled the world supremely. Therefore, based upon a triple application of prophecy, before modern Rome, before the papacy of today, takes control of the world and rules supremely, it's going to have to conquer three geographical areas. Daniel 1140, the king of the south, the Soviet Union. Daniel 1141, the glorious land, the United States. Daniel 1142 and 43, Egypt, the entire world. When the papacy takes control of Egypt, it has conquered the third geographical obstacle and it rules the world supremely. The characteristics of pagan Rome combined with papal Rome identify the characteristics of modern Rome. It's a triple application of prophecy. There's, I'm leaving lots out. I'm simply trying to show you how a triple application of prophecy works. Do you follow me? How many of you own the book Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith? That's pretty good. How many don't? Okay. Yeah, okay, that, that's okay. How many have read the book? Okay. Now, do you do, you, do, you do real? Uh, how many, how many believe that when Sister White gives us counsel to do something that we're supposed to do it? Uh, don't answer that, don't answer that because it might be embarrassing. D she says all of us are supposed to own that book. Did you know that? She doesn't use those words, but she says that we're supposed to be giving that book out to our neighbors. Mm -hmm. You have to own it if you're going to give it to your neighbors. And in the context of saying that, you know what she says about that book? It's God's helping hand. All right. There has never been, there's problems in that book. There's some, there's some places I disagree with Uriah Smith because he is wrong. But nevertheless, there's never been a better presentation on the Millerite understanding of prophecy put in one book ever. Nothing even close. Not even close. Um, it, it's still God's helping hand this very day and we should still all own it. But the reason I'm saying that is I'm now going to show you a triple application of prophecy in the book of Revelation. And generally the history that I'm going to refer to is unfamiliar to us in Adventism. And instead of sta spending very much time explaining the history I'm going to point out, I'm going to tell you that I'm giving you a history that's drawn right out of Uriah Smith's book. And when you go test this, you just go to his book and see if I'm giving you an accurate representation of the Millerite understanding of the trumpets of Revelation. And in the trumpets of Revelation, the Millerites understood that the trumpets represented the hir historical forces that brought down Rome. You go to Revelation chapter 8, you'll find that the first trumpet in verse 6 was a Laric um, out of the north, one of the barbarians. Um, you can date, it, date him from 395 to four, 410. The second trumpet, verse 8, is Genseric out of northern Africa that began to ravage the the sea lanes of Rome and bring problems to Rome that way. You can mark um, 428 there for Genseric. And the third trumpet, verse 9, Attila the Hun, 433, he arrives, another barbarian out of the north. And the fourth trumpet, Odiacer, verse 12, 476. And by the fourth trumpet, the and the Western Rome has been divided into ten nations in fulfillment of Daniel 7. Daniel 7, if you remember, says that the fourth kingdom of Bible prophecy, pagan Rome, was going to ultimately be divided into ten kingdoms. And from those ten kingdoms, three would have to be plucked up in order for the papacy to come. Well, Rome disintegrated into the ten kingdoms by the year 476 and this was brought about by the first four trumpets. That's the pioneer understanding. The pioneers, uh, one of its their primary arguments that a trumpet represented the historical forces that brought down Rome was the story of Jericho. Trumpets represent the bringing down of a kingdom. Once, once you get to verse 13 of Revelation 8 
and the first four trumpets have been identified. Are, is everyone with me? Verse 13 says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by the reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels which are yet to sound. The seven trumpets are divided in the sense that the last three trumpets are three woes. And I'm suggesting to you that the three woes are a triple application of prophecy. And when you take the characteristics of the first trump, first woe, the fifth trumpet, and combine them with the characteristics of the sixth trumpet, the second woe, you will be identifying the characteristics of the third woe. Now, seventh trumpet. Sometimes I write it on the board, but everyone has notes, right? Okay, so if you go to page 37, you'll see... Do you have the notes, brother? Not those notes. That's William Miller's rules. Now, I'm telling you out front, there are characteristics of the first woe and the second woe that I am not including in this. Okay? I'm not putting them in there because they disprove our point. I don't put them in there. They actually are s some of the strongest arguments for our point. But it is, it's very detailed information that isn't conducive to this presentation. So I'm telling you I'm leaving some of the characteristics out. But I'm giving you enough of the characteristics of the first and the second woe that we can see what we should expect the third woe to be. All right. The fifth trumpet, um, it, it switches from the barbarians and it switches to Islam. The pioneers understood that Islam is the power represented in the fifth and sixth trumpet. Um, look at Revelation 9. We have some time, right? It's when do we have to end? We have to end at 3.30? Okay. Relax, I won't go that long. <laughs> Revelation 9, verse 1. This is the fifth trumpet. Pioneers identify this as Islam. Um, it's represented on the 1843 chart right here. The reason it's represented as this horse is when we go through chapter 9, you'll see that one of the primary symbols of Islam here is these war horses. When Sister White gave direction that the, her husband was to produce a new chart and they produced the 1850 chart, you'll see the fifth trumpet, Mohammedism, what we would call Islam today. Once again, the war horse, fifth trumpet, war horse, sixth trumpet, Mohammedism, Islam, same as this, no change. Pioneer understanding <laughs> that the, the symbol of Islam is this horse. I, I have you in Revelation 9, but before we go there, let's... Let's add lib a little bit. Go back to Genesis 16, 12. The, the father of Mohammedism in the Millerites day and age and modern Islam for us today is Ishmael. And there's a prophecy concerning Ishmael that you can find in, in Genesis 16, verse 12. There's much to say about this prophecy, but I just want to show you one thing. 16, 12 says, And he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. The prediction for Ishmael's descendants at the end of the world are they are the ones that bring every man's hand in the world against them. The reason that this has to be accomplished is because Satan is working to bring in a one world government and in order to bring in a one world government he's going to use Islam to keep create such a crisis that the world's going to decide that the only way that we can deal with radical Islam is to bring the world under the umbrella of a one world government and that's right here in this verse and you can show that prophetically that's not what I'm dealing with now what I'm dealing with now is it says that the descendants of Ishmael, Ishmael will be a wild man okay and this world word wild is more often than not in the scriptures translated as the wild Arabian ass Okay, and the wild Arabian ass is a donkey or it's a horse. What I want you to see is the very first reference to Islam in Bible prophecy 
is a horse okay so when we get down to revelation and it, we're seeing Islam again and the fact that it's being symbolically represented as a horse that's very biblical and scriptural all right and sister white says all the books of the bible meet and end in the revelation and the dna of islam in bible prophecy is it's the wild arabian ass and one of the one of the things that uh, is associated with the wild arabian ass is its its breath you know it's breathing in and is exhaling the job speaks about this other passages speak about it and the breath the breath the breathing is associated one of the characteristic characteristics of Islam and it's actually a characteristic of the wild Arabian ass because when the the Arabians are going across the desert on their camels um, they bring their wild Arabian ass because it has the ability to smell water through the sand with its nostrils so that's that's a characteristic of Islam that shines through in Bible prophecy Lord willing we will deal with that a little bit more later but I want you to see if you go back to Revelation 9 that the symbol of Islam is the horse verse 1 of Revelation 9 says and the fifth angel sounded this is the fifth trumpet this is the first woe and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit and he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power one of the symbols of Islam and the descendants of Ishmael from the beginning of the Bible to the end the Bible says in some places they were like grasshoppers for numbers and grasshoppers and locusts are interchangeable same word depends on how it's translated in the Bible that's one of their symbols De describing that they're a great multitude because that was part of the blessing upon Ishmael is that he would become a great nation and the pioneers correctly understood that the fifth trumpet here that when this key was opened the smoke that came in the earth was the religion of Islam and the religion of Islam the religion of the Quran was going to block out the son of the gospel and that's how they described it and they said that Islam was raised up to chastise an apostate church. They understood that Islam was raised up to deal with the apostasy of the Roman Catholic Church. And if you've studied about Muhammad, that's exactly what Muhammad said. Muhammad was, he began his ministry because he was protesting that the Christian church had brought idols, protesting two things, had brought idols into the church, which he knew was wrong from the Old Testament. And one of the things, what was the other thing that the Quran identifies that Muhammad and they knew that the Christian church had went into apostasy. The Sabbath. They quit keeping the Sabbath. And that's why Muhammad was raised up. And I'm not putting any endorsement on the Quran. Uh, I like the title that the, that the one guy that fled to England to hide had for his book. The Satanic Verses. There's, I don't put any endorsement on the Quran. But the pioneers identify correctly that Islam was raised up to chastise an apostate church and that church was the papacy and this smoke is according to the pioneers the, the effect of Islam coming into history. And then in verse 4 it says and it was commanded and I didn't tell you about the key the pioneers understood that the key that allowed Islam to come into history is in that time period in the, in the time that Muhammad was alive and he was coming into power um, Rome got into a war with with Syria or Persia interchangeable terms in terms of geography um, initially Persia defeated Rome and it demanded great tribute of Rome to be sent to it read Darius Smith it's like a you know a thousand horses a thousand virgins a thousand talents of gold something on that level so in the beginning of this war this is the key this is the key in these three verses all right so if you don't know what the key is that's why I'm telling you this. In the beginning of this war, Persia defeats Rome, puts it in subjection, and this is the time that Muhammad's coming into history, and he tells, he sends a, a letter to the, the ruler of Persia saying, you need to come into line with me, and, and the Persian king just laughs him off. After Rome's put in sub subjection, it does a, a military feat that is still discussed in um, military literature. It does a maneuver where it goes up into northern Europe and it comes all the way down and it comes in behind Persia and they don't know it and it strikes from behind and when it does so it defeats Persia. 
But when it does so, it uses all of its strength and, and power to make this long drawn out trip and to fight the battle. So even though it's victorious here at, the, at this battle, which was the, the battle of Nineveh, it's powerless. It's, it wins, Rome wins, Persia's gone, but Rome does not have the power to prevent Islam from rising into history. And the key that allowed, that was turned, that allowed Islam to come into history was the fact that the two powers that could have prevented Islam from taking its position as a powerhouse for hundreds of years was that these two powers battled it out amongst themselves and depleted all their ability to resist it. That's pioneer understanding of that history in these verses. And it has an application that is beyond the scope of our weekend. But that war between Rome and Persia is prefiguring a war that goes on in Daniel 11 verse 40 between the king of the north and the king of the south. And as soon as this war between Rome and Persia is over and the key is turned in Revelation 9, Islam comes into history. And as soon as the war between the king of the south and the king of the north is accomplished in 1989, you should expect to see modern Islam come into history. And it did. Okay, so you, we're, we don't have time to go there. But, but these verses have connections that are, <laughs> they're, they're really sweet. They're, they're like honey when you wrap your mind around them. As soon as the key is turned and Islam comes into history, a mighty smoke, then you have verse 4. Verse 4 says, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. There's a book in Adventism called Truth Triumphant by Wilkerson, where he documents that in this history, as Islam began to carry out its war against um, Europe, which it did, and that's the testimony of Revelation 9, uh, that the first major general after Muhammad died was a, uh, a ruler named Abu Bekr and Abu, Abu, Be Abu Bekr's command that he gave in that history is still available and as he told the Islamic warriors to go out and bring warfare against the Roman church he says but when you do so you're going to find two types of Christians this is the paraphrase but he's, it's a broad paraphrase but this is the way that Bil Wilker Wilkerson will explain it to you as well you're going to find Sunday keeping Catholic Christians and you're going to find Sabbath keeping Christians and when you find those Catholic Christians you tell them to either accept Muhammad or you cut their head off but when you see the Sabbath keeping Christians you leave them alone and this command of Abu Bekr is here in verse 4 hurt not those that have the seal of God but only those that don't of course if you bring this down <laughs> into modern day history what we're saying is after the key is turned in Daniel 11 verse 40 we should expect to see Islam come into history in 2001 and the next thing that we should see is verse 41 a Sunday law in the United States where suddenly there will be a distinction between those that have the seal of God and the mark of the beast so um, those are the parts of the first and second woe I'm leaving out okay but I've at least told you what they are. There's, just, there's too much information that you have to develop to really prove that for you. The simple part, simpler part, is if you read D Uriah Smith's book on the fifth and sixth trumpet, the first and second woe, top of page 37, he will tell you that what is represented in the first woe is Islam of Arabia and the historical figure that's associated with Islam in Arabia is Muhammad. This is the birth and the rise of Muhammad. The key was this long drawn out war between Syria and Rome. The, yeah, in the, the history, Uriah Smith is going to tell you it's Syria, all right? But Syria is also Persia. And I use Persia for a prophetic reason. I'm not, I, they're interchangeable terms. And it's just a habit of I, I have that even though I may, may never see you again, if I see you again and we get on a study on this particular topic, we will have to explain to you about what Persia is. 
maybe we'll explain right now, all right? This, this is outside the scope of this, but we were told we have till 3.30, right? Okay. It's always a twofold power that places Rome on the, th on the throne, and it's always a twofold power that brings her down. Israel was a twofold power in Bible prophecy. You had a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, right? So that's a twofold power. That's what I mean. There's two kingdoms in this power, northern and southern. And Israel is what bought, brought Babylon to the throne. How did Israel bring Babylon to the throne? There was a king that didn't want to die, right? Hezekiah? He didn't want to die. So the Lord allowed him to live a little bit longer and to prove that he was going to do it. What did he do? He had the sun go backwards. So the, the Babylonians, they saw this and they say, we need to go to Jerusalem and see what's going on with the sun in Jerusalem. And when he gets there, um, what does Hezekiah do? Does he say, the Lord thy God. Does he lift up the Lord? He says, no, you want to see all the treasures we have? The motivation for Babylon to come to the throne of the earth was accomplished by a twofold kingdom. Israel, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. And who took Babylon down? The Medes and the Persians, okay? It's always a twofold power that puts her on the throne. It's always a twofold power that puts her down. Who put the papacy on the throne of the earth in 538? Who's the, the primary symbol of placing the papacy on the throne of the earth? She's called the firstborn of the Catholic Church, France. And in Revelation 11, verse 8, France is a twofold kingdom. Sodom and Egypt has two kingdoms in it. Who took the papacy down? France, twofold kingdom, put her, put her on the throne, twofold kingdom takes her down. Who places the papacy on the throne of the earth at the end of time? The United States. The United States has two horns, Republicanism, Protestantism. And the United States is the power between the, behind the ten kings, and the ten kings are going to burn her with fire and eat her flesh. It's always a twofold power. And the twofold power, one of the symbols of the twofold power in Bible prophecy is Persia. Okay, so the twofold power when you're dealing with prophecy is worth noting. And it re to really understand Daniel 11 verse 40 in the struggle between the king of the south and the king of the north you have to see this twofold power and that's why I call Syria Persia and now you know. So in if you're following Uriah Smith's book the characteristics of the first well the fifth trumpet is that it's Islam that began in Arabia Muhammad is the the figure it's describing the warfare Stand up for just a moment. Stand up for just a moment. There's, there's too many people nodding out. And one of them I'm married to. <laughs> I can't have that. It was enchiladas. Enchiladas, probably so. Hands up, deep breath. Okay, I don't know Portuguese, but in Spanish, siéntese por favor, and for the rest of us, let's, let's have a seat. The mode of warfare that is identified that Islam carried out in the first war is that they struck suddenly and un unexpectedly. If you are a, a web surfer and you get on an online dictionary or just have a dictionary and you type in the word assassin, you see that the word assassin comes from Islamic history because the Islamic warriors in this time period they would get extremely high on the drug hashish and it's from the word hashish that the word assassin comes from and once they were all high on hash then they would sneak up to someone and suddenly cut their throat and that's where the word assassin comes from. It comes out of Islam and it's describing their mode of attack. They didn't line up in red coats like the English did in the Revolutionary War and march at you one at a time. They struck suddenly and unexpectedly. They were directed by their tells, according to the passage in Revelation 9 and Isaiah 15 says, The ancient and honorable, he is the head, and the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tell. They're not being gu guided by a political figure, they're being guided by a religious leader. Okay, um, there is a command in the fifth trumpet to not hurt those that have the seal of God. The history you'll s you see below there from Muhammad, July 27th to 
1299 to July 27th, 1449 is identifying a 150 year time prophecy that is in the first woe, the fifth trumpet. At the conclusion of that 151, 150 year time prophecy, the second woe begins and also the 391 year 15 day time prophecy of the second woe, sixth trumpet begins. So what we're saying, the components of the first woe are, it's Islam, it's describing its mode of warfare. It strikes suddenly and unexpectedly. It was at war with the armies of Rome and it was being directed by religious leaders. The second woe, the sixth trumpet, um, was Islam only. This time it was Islam of Turkey. It's moved, um, moved north. This is the Ottoman Empire town period. It's not Arabia, it's Turkey. Their mode of warfare is also that they struck suddenly and unexpectedly, but the difference in this history is that for the first time in history, in 1453, when Islam blew down the walls of Constantinople and brought Eastern Rome to a conclusion, for the first time in history, gunpowder was used in warfare. So one of the characteristics that's added in here with the second woe is that they strike suddenly and unexpectedly when they bring warfare, but they do so with the use of explosives. The, they are also directed by their tales, religious leaders, and it is in the first woe that the armies of Rome are hurt, and it's in the second woe that ar the armies of Rome are, are killed, and as I just stated, in 1453, um, Constantinople, which at that time is the, the capital of Eastern Rome, it's brought to a conclusion. Um, now there's a difference. Some people stumble over this. The pioneers all taught, they all believed, that the, the sixth trumpet ended with the end of the time prophecy of the 391 years and 15 days, which ended on August 11th, 1840. If you read any Adventist literature, they'll tell you that the sixth trumpet, the second woe, ended on August 11th, 1840, but that's not correct. It ended on October 22nd, 1844, when the seventh trumpet began to sound. Okay, there's, there's prophetic reasons to say that, but... How many of you know who Hazen Foss and William Foy are? Okay, Hazen Foss and William Foy were given the spirit of prophecy before Ellen White. Okay, and if you go into any of the pioneer writings um, after after Sister White was established as the prophetess, you'll find that any of the books, the early books by the pioneers, that were defending and identifying that Ellen White had been given the spirit of prophecy, they first introduced the story of Hazen Foss and William Foy and said that both of those men were given the spirit of prophecy, but for two different reasons. They didn't live up to the, the qualifications of carrying that ministry on and that it was given to the weakest of the weak, Ellen White. But the pioneers clearly taught that they understood that Hazen Foss and William Foy were given the genuine spirit of prophecy. This was not false prophecy. This was not fanaticism. These people were actually chosen and given opportunity to be prophets by the Lord. And for whatever reason, they turned it down. That's pioneer understanding. The pioneers also taught that the sixth trumpet ended on August 11th, 1840. There's a prophetic reason why this can't be the case. And... Uh, for me, I was already arguing against the pioneer position for quite some time until I was confronted with the quote on the bottom of page 37. William Foy had a series of visions in 1842 while he was still um, receiving the spirit of prophecy and it just so happened that he went, it went to a public recorder and got, th got those visions legally recorded and when the pioneers are speaking about William Foy, they include his visions that he got legally recorded in their testimony about him. And this is a, an excerpt from one of the visions that William Foy received in 1842. In 1842 is after August 11th, 1840, right? Okay, now William Foy speaks in some very old-fashioned, what you would call black, black man English from that time period. Um, so it's, it's a, he has some little bit of awkward English, you've got to know that, plus the English, English is a little bit different from that time period anyway. But here's, here's an excerpt from this vision. Near the place through which we passed, I beheld a mighty angel clothed in a pure white raiment, having a crown of brightness on his head. He appeared to be gazing through the bar, and his eyes, like lamps of fire were fixed with steadfastness upon the earth. 
he stood with his right foot placed before him as though walking and his object appeared to be to reach the earth but three steps remained for him to take what do you suppose those three steps might have been yeah. anyway <laughs> against his breast and across his left hand were as it were a trumpet of pure silver and a great and terrible voice came from the midst of the boundless place saying the sixth angel has not yet done sounding in 1842 under inspiration William Foy said the sixth trumpet hadn't quit sounding the seventh we know every, well, everyone agrees seventh trumpet began to sound in 1844, October 22nd, 1844. So without getting into the details of the prophetic argument, I just want you to know that even though the pioneers marked the end of the sixth trumpet here, it ended here. The reason that you, prophetically that you need to understand that is in the first woe, you have a testimony of Islam, but in verse 4, you have a testimony that directly relates to the time period of the latter rain. There's in verse 4 of Revelation 9, there's a command, hurt not those that have the seal of God. That's prefiguring the latter rain time period during the testing time of, of Sunday law, mark of the beast seal of God. If you do not include 1840 to 1844 in the sixth trumpet, then you're eliminating the history in the second woe, the sixth trumpet, that is also an illustration of the latter rain Sunday law time period. And you, you need to recognize that the first woe and the second woe are illustrating the latter rain Sunday law time period. And if you stop the sixth trumpet here, as the pioneers do, you're cutting out 1840 to 1844. And in Great Controversy, Sister White clearly says 1840 to 1844 is an illustration of the latter rain. And it's, it's basically upon that premise where I had understood it has to end here before I realized that William Foy had his statement in 1842. That being said, if you take the characteristics of the first and second woe, operating upon a triple application of prophecy, when the third woe arrives into history, It should be Islam, only it won't be Islam of Arabia or Turkey because when you bring those two testimonies together, it's talking about worldwide Islam. And the historical figure of the sixth trumpet was Atman. The historical figure of the fifth trumpet was Muhammad. And the historical figure of the third, well, I don't know, but I identify as Osama bin Laden. Um, their mode of warfare when they arrive in history is that they will strike suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives and I challenge you to pick up a newspaper for three days in a row maybe you could do it once but pick up a newspaper three days in a row where you won't see information about some Islamic person blowing himself up in a car bomb or strapping it on somewhere in the world striking suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives their work will be to attack the armies of Rome and the armies of Rome at the end of the world is the United States of America the United States of America is the one that's going to force the world to accept the mark of the beast the Revelation 13 is clear about that. There, if there, there's several symbols of the United States in Revelation 13. I'll tell you three of them. It's the beast that comes up out of the sea, right? If you, if you believe that, say amen. amen. No. <laughs> the, the United States is the beast that comes up out of the earth. All right? The beast before it came up out of the sea. The United States comes up from the earth. Is that not the case? Revelation 13? Amen. But it also forces the whole world to receive the mark of the beast in order that they might buy or sell, right? So one of the symbols of the United States at the end of the world is economic might, correct? The other symbol of the United States at the end of the world is if you don't have the mark of the beast, you're put to death. That's military might, okay? So it's interesting that when you look at September 11th, 2001, not only do you see Islam striking suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives against the armies of Rome, the United States, but when they do so, two of the planes go into the symbol of the United States economic strength. One plane goes into the symbol of United States 
military strength, where does the other plane go? Into the earth. <laughs> now, I, I know that everyone in this room is saying, why is he saying that? Doesn't he know that George Bush and the Jesuits and the globalists were the ones that did 9-11, all right? <laughs> Pardon me? Uh, yeah, uh, but anyway, th I, I realize all that. That comes up every single time, all right? Um, but let me show you something. In Revelation 11, verse 14. In verse 14 of Revelation 11, it says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. When you take the characteristics of the first woe, and you combine them with the characteristics of the second woe, you are identifying the characteristics of the third woe. 11.14 Revelation 11 verse 14 says the second woe is past. Therefore the second woe, the history of the second woe continues until verse 14 of Revelation 11, right? Amen? The second woe is past. So in Revelation chapter 9 when the second woe is describing the activities of Islam in conquering eastern Rome and bringing down Constantinople the history of the second woe does not end there. It continues on through the French Revolution because Revelation 11 is the French Revolution, right? And the French Revolution is what pr produced the effect that brought the papacy the deadly wound. And that's what the pioneers said the trumpets do. The trumpets said the pioneers understood that the trumpets represented the historical forces that brought down Rome. And the first four trumpets brought down Western Rome by the year 476. And the fifth and sixth trumpet of Islam, they brought down Eastern Rome by 1453. But it also included the history that identified the deadly wound of the papacy in 1798. So the sixth trumpet, the second woe, also brings down papal Rome in 1798. And that's why the second woe is not marked as concluding until after the French Revolution is identified because it was France that brought down Papal Rome, correct? And in Daniel 7, the fourth kingdom in Daniel 7 is who? Who's the fourth kingdom in Daniel 7? Rome. And what happens to Rome in Daniel 7 as history progresses? Fragments into ten, ten nations. But those ten nations are, are descendants of Rome and what do we call that Rome? Do we call that papal Rome? Pagan Rome. Those ten nations are pagan nations. And what power are they in Bible prophecy? What's pagan Rome identified as? It's the dragon power. Sister White says in Great Controversy, she says the dragon in Revelation 12 is Satan, but in a secondary sense it is pagan Rome. So pagan Rome is a dragon power. So when it disintegrates into ten kingdoms, those ten kingdoms are dragon powers. And one of those ten kingdoms is France, a dragon power. And France in Revelation 11 brings the deadly wound to the papacy. So in the history of the second woe, you not only have Islam attacking the armies of Rome and Constantinople in 1453, but you also have the dragon power. And who's the dragon power? Well, in the terminology of today, that's George Bush, the CIA, the Jesuits. So if, if you want to emphasize your argument about what took place on September 11th and say, no, Brother Jeff, it, that wasn't Islam. That was the dragon power. The second woe has those characteristics in it. And the characteristics of the first woe, combined with the characteristics of the second woe, identify the characteristics of the third woe. But I will still argue with you that the men on those planes were Muslims. They were Muslims. <laughs> but you know, I'm not denying that there wasn't strings pulled that, and things not taken care of that allowed it to happen. But nevertheless, the third woe arrived in history on September 11th, 2001. Now, that's, th that's only one argument to sustain that. Um, Let's leave it there. We have more to say about Islam. Everyone understand what we're saying? 
that a triple application of prophecy, the first two fulfillments will identify the characteristics of the third, and the three woes are a triple application of prophecy. And it's from applying this rule that allows us to see that on September 11, 2001, the third woe arrived in history. And the quote at the bottom of your notes we've already read, when the great buildings of New York City come down, then the mighty angel of Revelation 18 descends. The great buildings of New York City came down on September 11th. Shall we pray? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we wish to understand these things correctly and we ask that you'd give us a special measure of your spirit that we can discern correctly and that you give us the motivation that when we leave the mountaintop this weekend that we can go home and test these things, confirm them through your word, through, s through study, through prayer, through fasting. It's obvious to see that the, the end of the world is here and logic tells us that at, at, at this time you're going to raise your people up, bring them into position as your mighty army, Amen. but they need to have a message given to them that they can proclaim clearly. And if this be the message, we ask that you'd allow us to understand this in an intelligent fashion, that we can teach it to others convincingly and winningly. We thank you for being with us so far throughout this Sabbath, throughout this day. ask for your continued presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So the next presentation is on Islam as well. So let's is hold, right? Okay. Your so thoughts? let's hold off the questions until after that meeting. That way we have time to go on the hike. So let's all meet out. Any the any person that's going on the hike going on the